or really care about Ashley, but the information has got to be available for us and, uh, and, and for the regulators to be able to put the regulations into effect. And then the one thing that the industry people don't know, the people on the other side of the fence, is that it's not just that we just go, we're going to make you wear safer helmets. And it just pops up and it happens. There's a process that has to happen, and that's that it has to go to the, you know, the rules, the regulation, first of all, has to be drafted. It has to be made. Then it's, then it's sent to the LRC, the Legislative Research Commission. They go through and they change the language and everything. Then it has to come back to us. We have to change the language so that it, it fits with with what we're, with, you know, our industry, and then we have to send it back. So it, it's just a real long process that happens in order to get a regulation through. And, um, boy, if I'd have known that before, it was just, <laughs> I might have been looking for another job, I don't know. But, um, but I think we've come a long way. Kentucky likes to be um, the leader in the industry of um, safety and integrity, and we're trying to, to move forward on that. We've, like I said, we've, we've got the helmet regulations passed, and right now we're currently working on um, the better um, safety vests. And um, we got a long way to go there yet too. So um, you know, as as all these materials and everything become available, it's an ongoing, I think, process that um, we're always going to be working on and always, you know, working with the regulations. Well, thank you, and, and I, we can see from that that uh, you know the issues the issues are really the same throughout our sports world. We're trying to make it safer, but not change the character of the competition, and, and that's the challenge. Is how do we preserve what we want to preserve and still change and become safer? And I think, personally, I see some of the things that you adhere to are, are sort of silly, uh, silly barriers uh, to safety. And, and those are the things that we want to eliminate. It's, uh, you know, when, it, when, it's, when it's silly, we all see it and you realize it. But I think within the sport, that the athletes competing are the ones that are going to have to lead this charge. And that's my challenge. And of course, I don't have to challenge BC or whatever, but, but some are on board. But you're going to have to promote that, too, among your fellow competitors and, and start taking a stand. And, and we need that kind of leadership within, I think, within our sport. I'll ask uh, Peter to speak about polo, since that's actually what I enjoy doing the most right now, so on horseback anyway. Well, thank you very much. I really feel very uh, honored to be up here with this group. I think it's one of the first times where all the disciplines are actually in the same room together. And Apollo is sort of the, you know, the outside group. But our main thing is, with all of us, it is about safety. We all have to get up on the horse. And we realize that we have to break some of our old traditions and, and ways of doing things. And, and I uh, just my background a little bit is uh, I've been uh, playing polo for 45 years, second generation <coughs> polo player. Uh, 25 of them as a professional player, and currently as the executive director of the United States Polo Association. Before that job, I was 20 years as the uh, rules chairman of the USPA. So I understand how the rules are, are made and how literally, particularly with our sport from 1890, we really don't make a whole lot of changes. And just recently, we've been forced to. We've been forced to with our drug, uh, drug rules and, and what have you. This year, and we're taking a very slow, measured uh, time and effect with that. Is it, it doesn't do any nothing as good. You know, it's done overnight. So we've taken the first year, the first step to uh, do drug rules, and then this uh, this year we're doing adjudication for those drug rules. But for, as far as helmets, so our helmet rules are very lax. It's basically a helmet with a chin strap. Uh, and over the years, we've been uh, working with actually with Dave quite a bit. We test all of our helmets. Um, I'd like to recognize Amy Weishart, who is our uh, staff liaison for our safety committee. And a lot of what we're doing right now is, is getting information out to our members. Right now, we don't mandate any particular helmet, but we let them see the results, and, and you can go online and look at the results. Uh, what we've also done this year, just like the drug rules, we're trying to drag ourselves out of the 19th century. And we made a, a mandate for 2012 that the helmets would have to pass NOXIE standards. And we saw the different standards here, ASTM. Um, and basically, I have to say uh, a lot from Dave, um, telling us, go to the highest standards, what fits our sport. And we've given ourselves some time to do that, a couple of years to, to figure it out. Because right now, only one helmet passes ASTM and the NOXI standard. But typical, it's big, fat, sits on the head. Absolutely nobody, no one wears it. Tony Capola, who is a, a, a guy who sells a lot of helmets, actually, since that helmet was developed, 
has, has more helmets in stock than he did when he started, because everybody that would say, I want the safest helmet, they get it, put it on their head, send it back. So he's actually has not been able to move any of them. But what we have done, uh, Amy's help, organized a summit meeting for uh, manufacturers. I know uh, some of the manufacturers there are board. Uh, we all got together at Dave's uh, testing, and we got to really see what they do. And it's amazing. All the helmets that we thought were very good or better, or felt that they were terrible. I mean, you look at a two-foot drop, and you'd rather wear a baseball cap, I mean, for certain things. And then we look at the guy dropping the, uh, <coughs> the uh, ball on these new materials, and there are some helmets in polo that are very, very close to passing those tests. And our rule that goes into effect, we have a rule without any helmets. But that was the only way for manufacturers to realize that we were serious and we were going to make a change, and we need those helmets. So we, we need a two, two or three of them. We don't want one. But that's what we feel is making that next step is we, we forced ourselves first, and then now we're having to force the manufacturers to come up with the helmets, and, and hopefully they will. So anyway, thanks. Let me just say one. I think one of the things that uh, when, when we originally did was was that was it. We only had the one helmet, the Lexington helmet, and and we forced it. You know, they well they forced it at that time. They forced it. We arrived at this helmet. We didn't like it. We didn't like the way the strap felt. We we didn't like it. And uh, of course, we've come a long way um, with helmets and everything. And then and, and um, there's a lot more choices out there now. So we had to broaden the standards of of helmets so that you know and, and keeping in the legislative research commission language to be able to broaden the, the ability to use um, different helmets, the, the, EN, the English standard, Australian standard, the British standard, the SATRA standard, and use all the other standards. So, you know, it's, it's always an encompassing, ongoing um, um, problem. Well, what I'd like to do now is maybe open this up for some questions from the, from the group limited at the time here, 135. So, um, uh, if I shortchange anybody, it's going to be the helmet manufacturers with my apologies on time. I'm going to hold you to a tighter timeline with your presentations because I think you're getting, hopefully, as much out of this as, as the entire audience for, uh, you know, from the athlete's perspective. But we're still going to do all that. And, uh, and I'm going to ask Ken Phillips to be the uh, next presenter. But I think I'd like to have a little interchange for the audience with questions and answers maybe for the different reports or other things that we perceive as a barrier for this because at the end of the afternoon uh, I'm hoping that from from my perspective I want to have an action plan of how we promote a safer sport and and it could be multi-pronged with uh, challenges to the helmet manufacturers challenges to Dave uh, to, to work on uh, evaluating these rotational forces understanding what's happening a little more I think as we understand the mechanism we can design things that might come back to that. Uh, it's understanding that one thing that I think that we don't do very well uh, is collect data. We're doing that better at the FBI level than we did. We're certainly doing it in inventing now with falls. But I tried to look that up for this meeting and spoke with uh, Natalie Nesikans who does that for inventing at the FBI. And even though we collect the data for injuries at each jump, we don't really break out uh, what actually happened. Uh, was it a concussion? Was it a head injury? Was it a broken neck? And some of those international barriers are difficult. We had a fatality in Germany a couple of years ago. I know there were two, and, uh, and now we have a German physician that's on our uh, committee with me. But with that fatality, that uh, that rider was not even taken to the hospital. They don't know. They were just immediately taken to the, the funeral home. And so there's no question. Uh, it's like, well, what happened? Well, they died. Uh, you know, so that's not very valuable data when you're trying to really understand what's happening, how do we prevent this. And, uh, so, so that's another challenge, I think, is, is collecting data so you understand what's really happening you know, in our sport. So what I'll do is maybe just ask, I'll pick out questions and then hand the microphone to the appropriate person if, uh, if that's okay. John, did you have a question? Oh. Hi, BZ. Hi, John. Um, is this... Uh, a predominantly a U.S. issue. What do the writers say in Europe uh, about about the use of a helmet all the time? I think um, I think more people here wear helmets. Actually, in actual practice, they're in more of the 
kind of cool there to take your helmet off before you get out of the ring, but um, it, who cares? Just tell them they have to. Yeah. I think there's, uh, John can say, I think he knows there's already something in the works. And the last, just one thing that's not a barrier action? You don't need this yeah. probably. You yeah. need one thing that's probably not a barrier is I'm on the jumping committee of the FBI. And at the last jumping committee meeting, it literally took, uh, I was just inspired because of Beezy. She doesn't get on a horse without a helmet ever at home or anywhere else. And I was just thinking, I said, hey guys, what about making something that the riders always have to have a helmet all the time, anytime they're riding? It took about 30 seconds, and it's going forward as a recommendation. So there was, there was not even any argument about it within the jumping committee. Now, how far that goes uh, through the legal and everything of the FBI is another issue, but at least that, that committee is made up of people that practice a little bit in the sport, and there was no, uh, no discussion even. It's just common sense, no brainer. Another question. Yes. Another question. I'm sitting here in this meeting, and I've gone through the same experience probably 15, 20 years ago at the NHL level. Uh, at that time, we didn't have the data that, uh, that they have now on concussions. We just knew it was dangerous, and we had the same issues. The players said, "The old mirror thing. I'm not wearing it. I'm not wearing it." I think there was one guy that did. They took a lot of flack during the game. So what they said, "Well, here's what we're going to do. Uh, we're going to grandfather this. We're going to put a date down." After that date, if you're doing his pro levels, you have to wear a helmet. And now you see on the ice, you don't see any players wear a helmet. Back then, it was just a rarity. Um, and then in Canada, um, they they went to legislation and mandated as law. So the younger kids had to wear, when they step on the ice, they had to have a helmet on. Anytime you're on the ice. Um, and what we saw happen was that those kids, as in, the, as in this industry, they came up to the ranks, and it was just a no-brainer. They said there's much people around this now like, I just can't see myself without something on my head. So you're dealing with uh, high-level athletes that, you know, they have reasons why they don't think they should work, even though now it's reversed. Back then, we didn't understand the concussion, but now we do, and we know what the ramifications are. So I think the education thing now is big, that's the way. But I don't see, you almost got to draw a line in the sand and say, guys, I'm sorry. You know, from here on in, it's got to be. And, and traditions change. Yes. Um, as you go forth and you adopt these rules that are going to be basically required, then how are you going to enforce that and how are you going to change people's behavior? Which is two, which is two basic concepts. You know, behavior kind of comes with both positive reinforcement and then also negative reinforcement. But I mean, you can have the best rule that's out there, you know, and in the case of the California thoroughbred, you know, industry, when I first started working with them, they had the rule on the book for the helmets, you know, you know, and also for vests. And people could wear whatever they wanted to wear, you know, and it wasn't basically followed up, it wasn't, you know, it wasn't reinforced. Um, you know, I mean, not just you, PJ, but also, you know, I mean, you know, how does the U.S. Equestrian Federation